I'm really um, interested in the concept of pluralism because in this formula of pluralism in public service media, the, the question of what we mean by pluralism is essential. And it's particularly essential, uh, and here I'm taking uh, from an article by Ellen Goodman, a, a brilliant scholar, uh, and a lawyer, professor in Camden, New Jersey, that the concept of pluralism and the writing of pluralism has largely been developed in an, area, in an era of media scarcity. And the question is, what happens in an era of media abundance? It, what's, what, what do we mean by pluralism? And how does, how does public service media intersect with what we mean by pluralism? So let's see if I can. So I have this slide called Defining Pluralism, which of course can't be defined. Um, and and the, the problem of defining it is, is is probably the essential part of, of the talk. So I, I've put here um, a number of elements which are commonly thought to be aspects of pluralism. Uh, the, the main one, of course, being uh, seeking the availability of many differentiated voices. And we'll see here themes that are common to ideas that are central to Central European University. Th this idea of many voices is one that, that seems self-evident, wonderful, et cetera, and is, is, is the kind of linchpin of, um, uh, of pluralism as we come to mean it. I'm not, I'm not sure that I want to exactly challenge it, but I want to ask in a certain sense question of how many or how differentiated uh, these voices are, what, what this, is, is there, is, is, I, I once thought of this question this way in, in the definition of public trial, for example, is there an inner limit and an outer limit? Is a, is a trial in a stadium a public trial or is a public trial something which is confined? That is to say, there's a, 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 an aesthetic of what constitutes public. So here, here the question would be, what do we mean by many and differentiated uh, voices uh, as, as part of pluralism. Um, so this is the, the, we'll get to this question of seeking to ensure that certain voices or perspectives are represented in the public sphere as a, uh, as a, as a role of pluralism in public service media. And, and um, a, again, the question of who decides which are the certain voices or perspectives that are represented, how do you decide on the scope of representation, uh, seeking some degree of fairness in the distribution of representations in the public sphere. Uh, I, I was just interested, for example, in a um, recent question involving the BBC Charter. Uh, the last BBC Charter uh, says the BBC must ensure that it reflects the diverse communities of the whole of the United Kingdom in the content of its output, the means by which its output and services are delivered, including where its activities are carried out and by whom, and in the organization and management of the BBC. So this is a very comprehensive idea of what we mean by um, fairness in the distribution of representations. This led to a debate about is this representations on the screen? Is it representation inclusion off the screen? How to, what, what's, the, what's the role of, of thinking about pluralism in this, in this aspect of it? And this becomes very central because Ofcom, the Office of Communication, now has new authority to regulate the BBC. And the question is, how does, the, how does, the, how does um, Ofcom undertake this responsibility? And I, I'd be, I, I think this is a, an interesting document. Um, so, I, I, I'll talk a little bit in this, in this presentation about different kinds of pluralism, what I call <laughs> managed pluralism, which, by which I mean uh, a kind of response to each of these questions, that, uh, an entity that decides, or many entities dis that decide, or a kind of very, even an algorithm that decides uh, what constitutes the uh, many differentiated voices and how to create many differentiated voices. 
how to ensure that certain voices or perspectives are represented in the public sphere, that, that, that there's a kind of managed pluralism. And what's managed pluralism to be contra distinguished from? How, what's the thing that is non-managed pluralism? Uh, and here, I, I want to use a term uh, developed by Ithiel de Sola Pool, the technologies of freedom, the, the idea that some technological interventions um, liberate the media from being managed and in, in a way create uh, something which I'm going to call for the purpose of this talk hyperpluralism. Hyperpluralism would mean unmanaged pluralism or pluralism that has a kind of series that goes to closer to infinity. That is to say, rather than saying many differentiated voices, whatever differentiated voice you want or one wants or, or occurs so that the individualization of media is a kind of in infinity of differentiated voices, uh, you, shaping your own voice, the shape, or I'm not saying your own voice, shaping the voice you want to hear, the, the broadcasting of me. So in a sense, I'm, I'm trying to contrast a, a kind of idea of managed pluralism from an idea of hyperpluralism, uh, et cetera. Uh, now, in there, there are ways which have been developed by very great experts, including Bayer Yudit, which is how to, how to think about pluralism. And I've, I've listed a, a number of uh, uh, categories here, which are, are, are mechanisms for thinking about managed pluralism. And then the question might be how to look at those in an era of hyperpluralism. So pluralism of access simply means it, do, do you as a recipient have access to many providers? Do you, it, it could be many platforms, many stations, many um, satellite providers, uh, uh, many, many internet providers. So plural of access is a, a diagnostic tool. It's, a, it's an analytical tool for thinking about the specific, specifics of pluralism. So there's pluralism of access, there's pluralism of content, um, and you can decide what, what you think is, is more important in terms of thinking about pluralism. Is it access to different views uh, or is it access to different mechanisms for de delivering views? So that's a, a, a kind of uh, well thought out uh, way of thinking about pluralism. And, and, and here's, I think, building on work of Marius and, and the Open Society Foundation, the, the question of media concentration as being uh, hostile to um, pluralism of access, having greater transparency in media ownership uh, uh, is, is an aspect of this. And this has given birth to a, a number of media pluralism measures, which, as I say, a number of people here have, have worked on. Uh, and, uh, and, a, and a desire to have the EU be a more effective supervisor of pluralism. Uh, so all, all these things, I'm presenting them. I haven't dis decided, I'm, I'm not um, familiar enough to be as cynical about this as I wish to be, which is my, my usual way of, of approaching these subjects. But it, this is, these are very important values and very important qualities, so therefore I'm trying to suspend skepticism and, and cynicism, but uh, it's important to have it. And that's another element of the talk, which is what is the kind of, what is, what, what's, what's happening in this kind of world of pluralism and, and how do these measures measure the right things? Are they asking the right questions, et cetera, which uh, I'm not sure I'm ready to answer. Um, so getting back to public service media in this plural world, what, how, do, how does the public service media respond to this as opposed to other ways in which states or media can respond and be part of an, uh, a more plural ecology? So uh, in other words, going back to this question of, uh, I, I forgot to do all these little, that's plural access. So um, sorry about that. So the, uh, obviously, 
these involve far more than public service media. They involve all media or all entities. They involve universities. They involve a number of other producers of content or platforms in society. So uh, to some extent, this question is about the role of public service media. But you can't answer that question without thinking about pluralism and the entire media environment. But historically, public service media has been thought to have a kind of specific role in all of this. And again, the question which I want you to have in the back of your mind is, how does this role change in, in a time where we move from maybe managed pluralism to hyperpluralism or to uh, uh, a million pluralisms, et cetera? So uh, some of these are, are more familiar. The public service media is providing a supplement in a quasi-plural plural society model, model to provide groups with media for media. I, I'm not sure what all that stuff at the end means. I've, I probably should have erased some of those words. But uh, the, 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 the question here is, uh, it, it, we think of the public service media as looking at the, what's on offer and saying, what are the gaps? What are the market failures? Where, where are the areas? that need to be represented in public service media should engage in that kind of representation, uh, which is a kind of central idea of public service media and pluralism, that it stands ready, as it were, to repair problems in the presentation of pluralism. Uh, so I, I have this, I, I call this therapeutic pluralism, uh, or lubricant of a democratic society, or what I would call public service media as legitimators of a otherwise illegitimate media system. In other words, we have this, we have, uh, uh, we have a imperfect media ecology, and we have a desire for a managed pluralism. Public service media has the function of repairing that. Uh, it's not going to be well funded to do it. It, it's, it's not going to be a little confused in how it does it, but that's, that's, it's, that's a central aspect of its job. So these, these are particularly roles in periods of managed pluralism and, as I say here, what happens to these roles in periods of hyperpluralism. I'm not sure, I mean, we, we'll talk about that later. Uh, I'm not sure I have a, an answer to that. And, and maybe hyper, and one of the answers may be that hyperpluralism doesn't mean that there is adequate representation and the therapeutic role still has to be played. It's just <coughs> that the patient has a different kind of illness than it previously did. Um, so this is a, this is a, a quote from a, a kind of, a, from Diana Eck. I don't know who Diana Eck is, but uh, she, she's an advocate of, uh, uh, a set of religious uh, beliefs and, and was talking about religious pluralism. And I, I like this slide. Again, it, uh, it's possible to be cynical or skeptical about it, but I'll suspend that for a moment and say, this is, what is it that the word pluralism adds? What is it that pluralism, pluralism is really about? Uh, and, and reading this made me think of, uh, Roger Silverstone at Ellis, the late Roger Silverstone, who wrote a, a, a lot about ho what he called hospitality uh, towards views. It's something that I think Molnar Pater actually, you may not know that you think about this a lot, but I'll explain it and you'll see how it is. That, that <laughs> pluralism is not diversity alone, but the and the italics gives this energetic, energetic quality. It's the energetic engagement with diversity. So maybe that's one of the qualities that uh, pluralism in public service media does, but I'm not sure it accomplishes it, but that it, it not only fulfills the kind of legitimating role, but it, it actually engages energetically with diversity. We'll have to think of what that means exactly. We, we have in our lived lives a number of examples where that's relevant. Pluralism is not just tolerance, and th this is the hospitality idea coming from some ideas of Foucault, which 
I'm not sure I've read in the original, but it, Silverstone uh, comes up, develops this idea of hospitality, which is not just to tolerance, but the active seeking of understanding across lines of difference. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's that kind, and the pluralism, not relativism, but the encounter of commitment, and then it's based on dialogue. So you can think of many instances, including current ones, very current ones in Hungary, where this issue of, of how to think about these questions is important. And the issue might be, are, are public service media better trained to do these kinds of pluralism than others, or does public, you could ask yourself, does public service media have a role in educating access providers or content providers that these are ways in which they can, that they should push uh, providers to go, that, the, that the, it's kind of an educational enterprise or maybe models of how to deal with diversity in, in some way. Uh, th this is a, a plug for my own favorite idea, of the, the market for loyalties. Um, and in, in, in this idea of the market, and I, I, I'm now going to explore a couple of plays on the idea of pluralism. So uh, what this goes maybe to, again, what the center is involved with, which is media and power. Pl pluralism doesn't necessarily sound like it's about power. It sounds like it's about the nice things, engaging with diversity, tolerating diversity, et cetera, and not sheer power in some way. So this suggests that a pluralism as a kind of exercise in power, and it, it's, uh, uh, the notion that there are in various society, in many society, in every society, in every market, what I call sellers of in the market for sellers of allegiances. Believe, you think of political parties, or you can think of religions, you can think of modes of thinking of consumption, a whole variety of things, and say that we, we live bom bombarded every day by sellers in a market for allegiances. And the, and the interesting thing is how do, how do buyers behave? What do buyers do to indicate that they have shifted from one seller in the market for allegiance to another? Or you don't have to be, you can sell, you can buy from several at the same time, like you know, fruits and vegetables or something like that. And so here the question might be um, uh, <coughs> what, 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 how do people, indicate buying. So voting is one clear way that buyers show their uh, shift or, or show their purchases in a market for allegiances. But one that has come up recently is mobilization and going to the streets. So I, you know, let's say for 10 years I didn't go to the markets, go to the streets over X, but I would for Y. I changed that. That's a, that's a form of buying in the market for loyalties. So th this market, I argue is a, is a very important one, but like all markets, this is a probably too ra dramatic statement, all markets are ones in which the sellers try to seek out cartels to guarantee their own share of the market and also to, to exclude new competitors. So uh, <laughs> in the liberal world, everyone says they're for free markets, but in fact, they use whatever power they have often to affect and change that market through some sort of cartel behavior, which would limit new entrants, et cetera. And, and the contention I want to make is that um, media regulation is, a, is, is one of the most important areas in which the cartel, silent or not silent, not knowing or not knowing, <coughs> engages in this kind of cartel behavior. Like, who, who's, who's excluded? Which voices are excluded? Like, let's uh, take an example of this is terrorism. So, or hate speech. Hate speech is a, could be said to be, and I'm not saying it unkindly, cartel behavior that says these, these voices are permitted in the cartel. Uh, we're, we're not, we're, <laughs> we're, we're limiting 
the capacity of certain speakers to enter into the market. Uh, and, 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 and that's desirable, that's <coughs> desirable behavior. Um, let's see. Um, so, um, so th that's, and public service media can be one of the tools to accomplish this purpose. And I, I would say this, which is, in my view, also very important, a, an intelligent cartel opens up the market in some ways to competitors who would otherwise be excluded, again, as an exercise in legitimation as, or as a safety valve. And so public service media can perform that function. They can, they, they, they can, uh, they can, the cartel can use public service media to um, allow some expression by voices that would feel otherwise excluded or, or make the argument that, that other voices have an opportunity to express themselves. Uh, so the, the bottom two lines are, are, are key to this question, which is, are, are we moving, this is this $64,000 question, are we moving to a period where cartels can't function? This is like oil prices getting too low because the cartel can't manage the oil, but, uh, you, is, or the debasing of discourse because uh, cartels can't, can't control quality, or, you know, a variety of questions like that. But uh, this, this, is, this is like the gatekeeper function. It, it, it may well be that we're, we're moving from another one set of ways that cartels can control to another set of ways that cartels can, can control. And it may well be that this shift from one set of mechanisms to another empowers one set of speakers as opposed to another. So th this is a, a dramatic thing which is going on. And we could ask, again, it's, it's another way of rethinking pluralism to say plur pluralism is one aspect of this kind of cartel behavior or a product of this cartel behavior. Uh, Um, I, I uh, was just picking a, a couple of examples, which is, I, I was just reading this on the eve of the French election. Uh, it, it turned out, it could, it could discuss this at the American election, but this was discussed in the Financial <coughs> Times this weekend, which was, were there Russian influences in the French election on, uh, at the margin? Not, it's, it's too much to think that the cartel can, can totally transform it, but can they affect a point or two points? Can they, uh, can they delegitimate one candidate or something else like that? And so we have a, a general, so let's assume for the moment that the cartel rule in the United States was that foreign governments should not be able to enter the market for loyalties to affect election outcomes. And the, but uh, and, and there are mechanisms to do that, like limiting foreign contributions to candidates, et cetera. But, the, but there's a breakdown in the capacity to engage in that limitation. Or the same thing might be true in France. And so uh, you can, I, I have a, as an example, the, the German government in its effort to regulate Erdogan's campaigning in Germany before the referendum. And ineffectiveness in being able to do so. These are examples of trying to figure out to be, to have a successful cartel and, and impediments for that cartel to maintain its power. Um, uh, I, I've just written a book called Freedom of Expression and Globalization and something, it's the new strategic communication. So, I'm, I'm calling, in some of my writing, I'm trying to call, talk about, use the term strategic communication to describe the efforts by these large scale players to understand the, the markets they're in and understand the dynamic of these kinds of cartels, breaking cartels. Um, the, the, you could argue that all of the effort 
to get platforms to regulate hate speech, uh, violent extremism, and fake news are ways of imposing on the platform these cartelization uh, uh, opportunities. Um, so uh, I also wanted to raise, and, and maybe our anthropologist person can help me with this later, uh, an, another source of the idea of pluralism, which in my view has kind of dropped out of the discussion, uh, and that is the idea of uh, plural societies, uh, not as, a, as an origin of the term of pluralism. So plural societies is a specific way of thinking about how, describing how societies are organized. And it, uh, it developed in the 20th century. Furnival was a principal uh, social scientist who thought about this in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, where there are two or more distinct social orders living in parallel in one political order without much social intermingling. And you, you, in, in these kinds of plural societies, there were there are functional parallelism, parallelisms among the distinct social orders so that uh, it would describe work patterns, uh, school patterns, religious patterns, etc., and media organizations, so that you wouldn't have a common media. You would have a plural society would emphasize more a media that was specific for the plural society. So it's a, a very different idea of pluralism. It's not a very the, the idea of pluralism as we have come to think of it is both how to reinforce the inner core, but also how to have expressions across uh, groups within the society. This one is more about the former than the latter. And uh, it's, it's an interesting question whether it, how, where it exists and what the context of which societies are plural in this sense. Uh, and I, I uh, my, my favorite example of this, which is no longer a particularly good example of it, is the Netherlands, uh, which had a system. Is there anybody here from the Netherlands? I hope not. Well, you, uh, no, a pillarization, which had its foundations in, uh, in, in, uh, re in religion and uh, other, other kinds of distinctive features, but it meant that different groups in societies had their own church maybe their own neighborhoods, their own villages, uh, and their own broadcaster. But there, was an, there was also an integrative effort. And one of my favorite things with my wife uh, in 1972 was to go to Hilversum. Hilversum is a, was a village where the pillarization was performed. Each, each group, and there were like 12, I think, at the time, uh, who, who were entitled to this recognition as a pillar of Dutch society had its own villa where it produced programs. It had an allocation of time on the national networks. And in a sense, it was the group talking to itself and uh, reinforcing itself. And this was uh, an, an important element of Dutch society and of, of, of the organization of the media. It was, you, you could think of this as something that happens organically, as, as it often does. But here it was also managed plural society. It wasn't managed in a way of planned pluralism. Uh, I, I don't remember the details right now, but in, in Lebanon, at the settlement of the Civil War, something similar happened in which th they went from a kind of abundance of televisions and radio stations to one in which each of the warring groups received its own channel. And, and much of Lebanese broadcasting today still bears the mark of this in terms of how broadcasting is organized. So uh, again, this is not pluralism. It, it's a version of pluralism, or, or it's counter-pluralism. It's uh, hard to tell. But I, I, I think, in my view, this idea of plural societies 
has gotten lost in the way of thinking about pluralism, and it exists more frequently than it's thought to, uh, and here's, here's how it comes back, uh, which maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll talk about it in this slide, let's see. Yeah, I'll talk about it now, which is that you could argue, maybe, that we're moving towards pillarization, that is to say, or siloization, uh, and that pluralism has more of the characteristic of the plural society than it does of the open society, or that, that rather than uh, a pluralism that in which people talk to each other, it's a pluralism of, uh, and this is where the hyperpluralism comes in, you get to make your own, you, you choose and you, they're, well, there are different stages. One is if India wants to speak to its diaspora, it can do so through satellite and uh, television without frontiers directive, uh, et cetera. And so the, the, uh, the, the notion would be that um, you get much more reinforcing of the, of the group. And you may, you may uh, and, and the receiving entity, the receiving zone, is not as capable of limiting this shift that might otherwise be the case. In other words, the, it, it, let's go back to the Netherlands, for example. And this is a really important part of this for my construct. Not only were th was there pillarization, but there was a limit on who the pillars were. As they, there weren't, you couldn't just, be, you could become a pillar if you met the rules, but every, there weren't a thousand pillars. There were 12. And if you weren't in a pillar, then you didn't get time. Uh, so the, the hyper, hyper pluralism means you're not dependent on, it. it's hard to figure out what the limits are in, in, in that way. Um, so the, the question then is, what's the role of public service media in this new environment? And so I, I'm uh, going to just say a few things about that before closing. One of them uh, is, uh, again, uh, I did a reason read this article, which is an example of the US media trying to bridge ideological divides. So uh, it lists several post-Trumpian uh, examples. National Public Radio has a new program called Indivisible, which again, I, here I will be cynical and skeptical, which is the, the, the idea is that we're going to be indivisible. We're, just by saying it, we're going to further indivisibility rather than a divided we stand or whatever, uh, uh, divided we fall. So Indivisible is a radio program that now is on every night and it, it goes out of its way to bring conservative and liberal voices together. Uh, the Guardian has burst your bubble in which they, get, given that it's a Guardian audience, they, they want you to have five conservative articles and they bring it to your attention. This goes, we'll t talk about this later, this goes to exposure diversity as opposed to content diversity and uh, access diversity. BuzzFeed has outside your bubble and, and there are some apps that are designed to, to mandate diversity. Uh, I, I'm going to close with two slides taken from Ellen Goodman's work. It's a little awkward the way I've edited I haven't actually edited it here. I've just cut and pasted a couple things. One, one of them is the, the idea that there is, as I said, exposure pluralism. And, and of course, the idea of the plural society in a sense, limits exposures, uh, exposure pluralism. And the question is, how do, you, how do you engineer, can you engineer, exp can one ex engineer exposure pluralism? And is it, whose duty is it to engineer exposure pluralism? And is that, the, is that a task or a new task of public service media? Uh, uh, this idea of a serendipity engine breaks the pattern that si this is the silo program communities may have and ensure encounters with media they are not seeking. Uh, so um, 
Anyway, I, I think this is really important. And, and she notes this idea of informational justice and the idea of fair distribution of communicative, communicative power, getting back to your idea of power in the media. Uh, so, uh, and this goes from uh, um, the descriptive to the normative. Uh, a lot of what I, I like to do is the descriptive, and I, uh, it's hard to, I, I'm not as comfortable with the normative. The normative is that there ought to be uh, expo diversity exposure and that there's a duty to, to have it. Uh, and then, um, so, uh, of course, we all like technical solutions and algorithms is the technical solution of the day, uh, which is how do, al and what, how do algorithms play into this? D is there, do algorithms reinforce the silo aspect? Is it, is it the, the algorithms make it easier to, uh, or further advance um, the uh, 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 plural society idea of the subgroups? So they, does it uh, contribute to homogenization or differentiation? Um, so uh, as, as Alan Goodman suggests here, th this will be a subject that becomes really important in the, in, in, in the future. So, so I, I'm arguing that we're entering a period of millions of plural society caves, uh, plural society is the echo chamber, you get your choice of cliches, we're, we're going to have a lot of them in the, in the near, near future. Uh, but the, uh, this is a more insidious comment, which is that in the, wh where does the cartel go in a period of hyperpluralism when it's trying to, to manage stability, manage its share of the market, uh, et cetera. And, and I'm suggesting here three, three things which are, uh, and I'm sure there are others, uh, the use of force. Uh, is, if law doesn't function, how do we, how, what, do, what do powers do one of those use of force? Surveillance is another managing mechanism. Uh, I talked a little about the role of the platform. On the kinder side, uh, everyone talks about media literacy, that is to say, if only we could become better recipients of information, more knowledgeable about it, we would be in great shape so that we should pour a lot of money into media literacy, maybe. Uh, so uh, this becomes about the scarcity of attention and, and what uh, w is being called findability, that is to say, how, how, do, how do people who, who want to be part of a more plural society in the better sense of the term uh, find, uh, find the breakout of the way in which the algorithm forces them into silos or corners. Um, and then can, can the public service media perform its function of legitimation, safety valve, and bridge mechanism in this world? And I'm going to close with this metaphor of the fixity and evanescence of bubbles. Everyone talks about uh, the bubbles. So the bubbles look fixed on the interior. They're important in, as a way of uh, providing a kind of uh, um, Len, not lens, I'm not sure what the word is, a, a kind of cover uh, uh, that contains a certain silo, but it's also evanescent. So it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens to this idea of bubbles that we, or silos that we describe. So I'll stop with that. Thank you.